Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the ASHNR session on skull based imaging. My name is Jana Ivanice. I'm an assistant professor of radiology at Weill Cornell Medicine in New York City, and I am honored to co moderate this session with Dr. Robert Morales. I truly wish we could have held this meeting in person and was really looking forward to seeing everyone. I was especially excited to bring with me my three year old son, an aspiring astronaut, and take him to the Kennedy Space Center. Alas, but I applaud the organizers for having adapted so quickly and having put on an outstanding virtual program for us, despite the challenging circumstances everyone has faced over the past several months. Understatement of the year, I know. We have a great session for you today, first focusing on anatomy and then on differential diagnostic considerations. Our first speaker will be Dr. David DeLone. Dr. DeLone is a neuroradiologist at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. He has held multiple leadership roles in the ASHNR and has contributed to many publications, most recently including an anatomic and functional atlas of the cerebellum. Today, Dr. DeLone will be speaking to us about skull-based anatomy. Dr. DeLone, we look forward to your talk. Good morning. I'm Dave DeLone, and I'm going to be talking about skull-based anatomy. I'd particularly like to welcome those of you on the West Coast where it's really, really early. I'm going to start with the posterior skull base, which is comprised of the occipital bone, and the temporal bone. Here we see the egress of the lower cranial nerves through the jugular foramen and the hypoglossal canal and the egress of the facial and vestibular cochlear nerves through the internal auditory canal. The jugular foramen is located between the temporal bone and the occipital bone. If you like taking pictures of slides, this might be a good one. The hypoglossal canal, of course, contains the hypoglossal nerve, rarely a persistent hypoglossal artery. The jugular foramen contains the internal jugular vein, the inferior petrosal sinus, the glossopharyngeal nerve, the vagus nerve, the spinal accessory nerve, and sometimes the posterior meningeal artery. Jacobson's nerve, or the inferior tympanic nerve, is a branch of the glossopharyngeal nerve that arises in the jugular foramen. It passes through the inferior tympanic canaliculus going to the hypotympanum. Similarly, Arnold's nerve is a branch of the vagus nerve that arises in the jugular foramen. It passes through the mastoid canaliculus on its way to the descending facial nerve canal. In the carotid canal, we of course find the internal carotid artery and the sympathetic plexus. The foramen lacerum is filled with fibrocartilage. Through it run meningeal branches of the ascending pharyngeal artery. In the internal auditory canal, we of course find the facial nerve and the vestibular cochlear nerve, also the labyrinthine artery. The nervous intermedius is a component of the facial nerve. Viewed in the coronal plane, the jugular tubercles resemble bird's heads. This has been dubbed the double eagle sign, where this is the bird's uh, head, the bird's beak, and the bird's neck. Underneath the bird's chin is the hypoglossal canal. The jugular foramen is out here demarcated by the enhancing internal jugular vein. The jugular foramen has a somewhat oblique orientation. In Dave Daniels' 1984 paper, he wrote that to view it in an appropriate axial plane, you should scan it 30 degrees off from the campomiana line. Here's the jugular foramen, the pars nervosa, the jugular spine, the pars vascularis. The sigmoid sinus has something of a water slide curve to it coming down into the jugular foramen. This is the jugular foramen from below. Here's the hypoglossal canal, and the jugular bulb. Here's the hypoglossal canal from above and from behind. When I was a resident and a fellow, I used this mnemonic to remember what was in the pars nervosa and the pars vascularis, jig, and via. In the pars nervosa, you find the Jacobson's nerve, inferior petrosal sinus, and glossopharyngeal nerve. In the pars vascularis is the vagus nerve, the internal jugular vein, the spinal accessory nerve, and Arnold's nerve. The literature varies, however, regarding what's in the pars nervosa and the pars vascularis, and if they even exist. 20% of foramina are at least partially divided by bone into two foramina. The glossopharyngeal nerve enters the jugular foramen superiorly, anteriorly, and medially relative to the 10th and 11th nerves. That's a consistent finding. It usually enters a recess of its own, the glossopharyngeal meatus, which is routinely seen on uh, imaging. The vagus and spinal accessory nerves are anterior and medial to the IJ and the pars vascularis. The inferior petrosal sinus is between the 9th nerve and the 10th and 11th nerves and can join the internal jugular vein either in the foramen 
or below the foramen as in this case. Here's the venous anatomy. Here's the sigmoid sinus curving down to the jugular foramen. The inferior petrosal sinus is here, corresponding to here in the illustration. The cavernous sinus, of course. Here's the superior petrosal sinus corresponding to here in the illustration. And finally, the sphenoparietal sulcus is right here corresponding to here in the illustration. The internal auditory canal runs from the porus acousticus to the fundus. It, of course, contains the facial nerve and the vestibular cochlear nerve. The nervous intermedius is a component of the facial nerve containing sensory and parasympathetic fibers. The facial nerve runs to the labyrinthine segment of the facial nerve canal. The vestibular cochlear nerve is comprised of the cochlear nerve, the superior vestibular nerve, and the inferior vestibular nerve. The cochlear nerve, of course, innervates the cochlea. The superior vestibular nerve innervates the superior and lateral semicircular canal and utricle. The inferior vestibular nerve innervates the posterior semicircular canal and the saccule. Scarpa's ganglion lies along the inferior vestibular nerve laterally. It's a subtle fusiform dilatation, should be no more than 1.3 millimeters in diameter. It contains the cell bodies of bipolar neurons that synapse with the vestibular hair cells. The singular canal is routinely seen on temporal bone CT. It's right here. It contains the posterior ampullary or singular nerve, which innervates the ampulla of the posterior semicircular canal. It joins the saccular nerve to form the inferior vestibular nerve. On an oblique sagittal MRI scan, such as on this uh, T2 space scan, you can actually make out all four of the nerves in the internal auditory canal. This is the facial nerve, superiorly and anteriorly, seven up. Here's the cochlear nerve, inferiorly and anteriorly, coke down. And posteriorly, we find the superior and inferior vestibular nerves. When you get out towards the fundus, there are some septations of the IAC. The vertical septation is Bill's Bar, named after Bill House. The horizontal septation is Christophalsiformis. With appropriate angling. We can see this on imaging. Here's Bill's bar vertically, Christophalsiformis horizontally, and Christophalsiformis on MR. I'd like to thank Jack Lane for those images. The intertemporal course of the facial nerve and stylomastoid foramen is important for perineural tumor spread assessment, as well as a number of other reasons. Here is the stylomastoid foramen. I'm not going to get any more into temporal bone anatomy because Dr. Curtin is going to very thoroughly cover this on Sunday. The greater superficial petrosal nerve extends from the geniculate ganglion anteromedially to join the deep petrosal nerve to, to uh, form the vidian nerve underneath the trigeminal ganglion. It provides parasympathetic preganglionic fibers for lacrimation and for the nasal and nasopharyngeal mucosa. It's also an important communication between the facial and trigeminal nerves, particularly relating to perineural tumor spread. When perineural tumor spread is present, you can see the greater superficial petrosal nerve right here. Moving on to the central skull base, it's comprised especially of the sphenoid bone, also the occipital bone, and the petrous apex. It has relationships with the orbit, the pterygopalatine fossa, and the masticator space. It is adjacent to the cavernous sinuses and the cella. And here we see egress of cranial nerves 2 through 6. Here is another slide that you might want to photograph. In the optic nerve, we find the, excuse me, in the optic canal, we find the optic nerve and the ophthalmic artery. The optic nerve is sometimes called cranial nerve 2, although it's of course not a peripheral nerve, but rather part of the central nervous system. In the superior orbital fissure, we find the oculomotor nerve, the trochlear nerve, the ophthalmic nerve, the abducens nerve, and the superior ophthalmic vein. In the inferior orbital fissure, we find the maxillary nerve, the zygomatic nerve, small branches from the pterygopalatine ganglion, and the infraorbital artery and vein. Authors disagree whether the maxillary nerve is yet transitioned to the infraorbital nerve at the level of the inferior orbital fissure. The foramen rotundum runs from Meckel's cave to the pterygopalatine fossa. It contains the maxillary nerve, the artery of foramen rotundum, and emissary veins. The vidian canal contains the vidian nerve and the vidian artery.
The foramen of Vesalius, or the emissary sphenoidal foramen, only contains a trivial vein from the cavernous sinus. The foramen ovale runs from Meckel's cave into the masticator space. It contains the mandibular nerve and the accessory branch of the internal maxillary artery, sometimes the lesser petrosal nerve. Foramen spinosum contains the middle meningeal artery and vein and the recurrent meningeal branch of the mandibular nerve. In Dorello's canal, we find the adducens nerve. The horizontal petrous ICA is a useful landmark. Anterior to its mid portion is the large oval foramen, foramen ovale. Behind that is foramen spinosum. Anteriorly is the foramen of Vesalius. Here's the Vidian canal. Superiorly and laterally is foramen rotundum. The inferior orbital fissure. The superior orbital fissure. And the optic canal. In the coronal plane, here is foramen lacerum, foramen ovale, the optic canal, foramen rotundum forming, and the vidian canal. Here's foramen rotundum again, the vidian canal again, the superior orbital fissure, and the inferior orbital fissure. On MR, the horizontal petrous ICA is again useful in identifying foramen ovale with V3 running through it. Here's the Vidian canal, foramen rotundum, the inferior orbital fissure, the superior orbital fissure, and the optic canal. In the coronal plane, here's Meckel's cave. Here's foramen ovale with V3 running through it from Meckel's cave into the masticator space. The Vidian canal, the optic canal, superior orbital fissure, and foramen rotundum, and the inferior orbital fissure. The anterior petroclinal fold and posterior petroclinal fold form a little niche filled with CSF that the oculomotor nerve runs into from its external segment into its cavernous sinus segment. If you reformat this cis image appropriately, you can actually see the entirety of the oculomotor nerve's course through the cistern and the cavernous sinus. In the coronal plane, we see it here. Recall that the oculomotor nerve, trochlear nerve, and the first two branches of the trigeminal nerve run along the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. The abducens nerve is centrally within the cavernous sinus adjacent to the cavernous ICA. This is the abducens nerve within the prepontine cistern. It enters Dorello's canal here. It then follows this extradural course through Dorello's canal until it turns anteriorly into the cavernous sinus. The cisternal trigeminal nerve passes through the porous trigeminus into the Meckel's cave, crossing a, a subtle ridge of bone. Within Meckel's cave, we typically only see CSF and a few rootlets. That's because the trigeminal ganglion is adhered to the wall of Meckel's cave anteriorly, laterally, and inferiorly. On post-gadolinium T1-weighted imaging, the cavernous sinus enhances homogeneously and we don't see much within it. It's important to recognize that you do see gadolinium enhancement on cis or fiesta imaging. With the help of enhancement of the cavernous sinus, you can see the cranial nerves running through it, as in the case of the oculomotor nerve here, and possibly V1 and V2 over here. Here again is Meckel's cave, foramen rotundum, and the pterygopalatine fossa and inferior orbital fissure. Here we see fat within the superior orbital fissure. On the contralateral side, that fat's been replaced by meningioma, and here in the coronal plane is the superior orbital fissure. Here is Meckel's cave. Again, V3 running through foramen ovale into the masticator space, the Vidian canal, the optic canal, superior orbital fissure, and foramen rotundum, and the inferior orbital fissure. You'll notice that you don't see many branches of V3 inferior to the foramen ovale. Uh, 
The reason for that is that V3 uh, breaks up into multiple branches shortly below the skull base, uh, specifically the lingual nerve here, the inferior alveolar nerve here, as well as the auriculotemporal nerve and the deep temporal nerves. On good quality axial imaging, you can follow the inferior alveolar nerve all the way through the trigeminal fat pad to the mandibular foramen. You can also follow the lingual nerve at least as far down as uh, the mandible. The pterygopalatine fossa is this niche right here, anterior to the pterygoid process and posterior to the maxillary sinus, specifically posterior to the perpendicular plate of the palatine bone. It contains uh, multiple important structures, including the maxillary nerve, the vidian nerve, the pterygopalatine ganglion, and the greater and lesser palatine nerves. Viewing it from the lateral side, here we see the maxillary nerve, the zygomatic nerve, which is an important branch that doesn't get talked about a whole lot, the pterygopalatine ganglion, the greater and lesser palatine nerves, and the posterior superior alveolar nerve. Parasympathetic preganglionic fibers come in along the vidian nerve and synapse at the pterygopalatine ganglion. Postganglionic fibers pass along the pterygopalatine nerves to the maxillary nerve, to the zygomatic nerve, through the inferior orbital fissure, and then along the zygomatic temporal nerve. The fibers then communicate with the lacrimal branch of the ophthalmic nerve to supply the lacrimal gland and the mucosa of the nasopharynx and nasal cavity. On the sympathetic side, postganglionic fibers arise from the superior cervical ganglion, passing along the carotid plexus, becoming the deep petrosal nerve, which then joins the greater superficial petrosal nerve to form the vidia nerve. Sympathetic fibers pass through the pterygopalatine ganglion without synapse and then distribute analogously to the parasympathetic fibers. The pterygopalatine fossa is often compared to a box with holes along its respective sides. Along the posterior wall of the box, we find foramen rotundum in the vidian canal, as discussed previously, also the palatal vaginal canal and the bare marrow vaginal canal. Medially is the sphenopalatine foramen, laterally is the pterygomaxillary maxillary fissure, anterior superiorly is the inferior orbital fissure, and inferiorly are the greater and lesser palatine foramina. Here are the greater and lesser palatine foramina, the pterygopalatine fossa proper, the pterygomaxillary fissure laterally, the sphenopalatine foramen medially, the vidian canal, foramen rotundum, inferior orbital fissure, and inferior orbital fissure. Again, as discussed previously, along the posterior wall is the foramen rotundum containing the maxillary nerve and the artery of foramen rotundum. The vidian canal is here containing the vidian nerve and vidian artery. Probably the palatal vaginal canal is here containing the pterygovaginal artery and the pharyngeal nerve to the eustachian tube. It's hard to be definitive about that. The vidian canal was named after Vitus Vidius, which is the Latinized name of Guido Guidi. He was a 16th century Italian surgeon and anatomist who actually became a Roman Catholic priest later in life. Medially is the sphenopalatine foramen communicating with the nasal cavity. The most important structures passing through it are the sphenopalatine artery and the nasopalatine nerve. The posterior and superior nasal nerve also passes through it. Laterally is the pterygomaxillary fissure communicating with the masticator space. It transmits the maxillary artery here and the posterior superior alveolar nerve. Anterior superiorly is the inferior orbital fissure, which of course communicates with the orbit. It contains the infraorbital nerve, the zygomatic nerve, small branches from the pterygopalatine ganglion, and the infraorbital artery. Inferiorly are the greater and lesser palatine foramen extending down to the palate. They contain the greater and lesser palatine nerves and the greater and lesser palatine arteries. The greater palatine nerve runs along the hard palate to the incisor teeth, gingiva, and mucosa. The lesser palatine nerve supplies the soft palate, the uvula, and the tonsil. Again, the greater and lesser palatine foramina, the pterygopalatine fossa proper, the pterygomaxillary fissure, the sphenopalatine foramen, vidian canal, foramen rotundum, the inferior orbital fissure, and the inferior orbital fissure. In the coronal plane, the vidian canal, the forming foramen rotundum, the vidian canal, probably the palatovaginal canal, foramen rotundum, vidian canal, palatovaginal canal, sphenopalatine foramen, greater palatine foramen, and the inferior orbital fissure. On MR, 
the greater and lesser palatine foramina, the pterygomaxillary fissure, the spinopalatine foramen, vitean canal, foramen rotundum, and the inferior orbital fissure. Here again is the vitean canal, the forming foramen rotundum, the vitean canal, foramen rotundum, vitean canal, inferior orbital fissure, pterygopalatine fossa, and the infraorbital nerve within the pterygopalatine fossa. The anterior skull base is comprised of the sphenoid, ethmoid, and frontal bones. It has a primary relationship with the nasal cavity, sinuses, and orbits. The cribriform plate, fovea ethmoidalis, and plane of sphenoidale are all components of the anterior skull base. Immediately below it are the olfactory recess, the ethmoid air cells, and the orbits. The frontal sinuses are anterior. Here is the plane of sphenoidale the posterior ethmoid artery canal, the anterior ethmoid artery canal, the fovea ethmoidalis, and the cribriform plate. This is the foramen cecum. The anterior ethmoid artery and posterior ethmoid artery are branches of the ophthalmic artery. The anterior ethmoid artery goes on to become the anterior falcine artery. The anterior ethmoid artery is not always as securely protected by bone, as in this case. Occasionally, there are air cells above, or it can be frankly dehiss, and it's important to note that in your sinus CT reports. If a surgeon bags the anterior ethmoid artery, the endoscopic field of view, of course, becomes bright red, but it can get worse than that. The transected artery can retract into the orbit where you then have an uncontrolled arterial bleeder behind the lobe. The posterior ethmoid artery is much better protected um, it's said amongst the surgeons that if you get bleeding from that, you're also going to have a CSF leak to contend with. The attachment of the middle turbinate divides the cribriform plate into a medial lamella and a lateral lamella. The olfactory recess um, is home to the olfactory mucosa, which uh, extends inferiorly both laterally and medially. It contains the olfactory receptor cells. There's an excellent discussion of the neurophysiology of olfaction in Sam and Curtin's book. What I find particularly interesting is that the olfactory receptor cells are not specific to odorants, but rather they are specific to certain chemical moieties on the, uh, on the odorant molecule, such that the red receptor cells may be specific to aldehydes and the green might be specific to alcohols then all the red cells converge on the red glomerulus sensitive to aldehydes, and the green cells converge on the green glomerulus specific to alcohols, for instance. And these cells here in the olfactory bulb will then integrate that and create sort of a composite picture of what the odorant looks like to the olfactory system. This information is then taken back along the optic tracts to the medial and lateral olfactory cortex and from then on to the hypothalamus and hippocampus, respectively. Here is the olfactory bulb in the coronal and sagittal planes. The olfactory tract is harder to see. Thank you very much. Thank you especially again to the people on the West Coast. Good morning. I'm Rob Morales from the University of Maryland. I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Farid from UCSD, where she also serves as the program director for the MRI Fellowship. The title of her talk on skull base imaging is True Lesions versus Pseudo Lesions. Good morning. I'd like to thank Dr. Schnaufus and the rest of the program committee for the invitation to speak at this historic virtual ASHNR meeting on pseudo lesions and don't touch lesions of the skull base. I have no disclosures. The objectives of this talk are first to illustrate the imaging features of the most common pseudo lesions of the skull base with emphasis on how to distinguish these entities from true lesions of the skull base. Next, we will explore the imaging features of the most common don't touch lesions of the skull base with emphasis on how to make a definitive diagnosis based on imaging alone. And the purpose of all this is to ensure that we avoid unnecessary workup and potential harm to the patient when we encounter such pseudo lesions or don't touch lesions. <laughs> 
remembering at all times our Hippocratic Oath of first do no harm. We will begin with pseudo lesions. On this axial CT image through the central skull base, we see a relatively lucent appearance of the sphenoid bone. It is bilateral, there are well-defined sclerotic margins, and there are areas of curvilinear calcification within. On the second example of the same entity, we see a very similar appearance of the sphenoid bone. However, this time it is unilateral. And on the concurrent soft tissue windows, we see that this area demonstrates fat attenuation. And these are both examples of arrested pneumatization of the sphenoid sinuses. In contrast, in this case, we see a destructive lytic lesion involving the left sphenoid bone and the adjacent anterocloinoid process. There is a soft tissue component that protrudes into the sphenoid sinus. And on the post-contrast image, we see that the lesion is enhancing and extends into the adjacent optic canal. And this was an example of a sphenoid sinus plasma cytoma in this patient with known multiple myeloma. Arrested pneumatization is an anatomic variant that occurs when pneumatization is either interrupted or never commences. It most often involves the sphenoid sinuses and adjacent pterygoid processes. It can be unilateral or bilateral, and when bilateral, it can be asymmetric. On CT, again, we see areas of fat attenuation, curvilinear calcification, thin sclerotic margins, and no mass effect on the adjacent skull base foramina, as demonstrated here with completely normal appearance of the petrous carotid canal. On MR, these areas would demonstrate high signal on T1 and no associated enhancement. Our second example of a pseudo lesion is demonstrated on these sagittal and axial T1 weighted images where we see asymmetric T1 hyperintensity of the left petrous apex, noting preservation of the normal bony contours. And on the current concurrent CT, we see that there is normal osseous matrix within that petrous apex. And this is an example of asymmetric pneumatization of the petrous apex, an entity that we often encounter. In contrast, in this example, we see a large expansile lesion of the right petrous apex, which is both T1 hyperintense as well as T2 hyperintense. Here on the concurrent CT, we see smooth expansion of the bone and we see preservation of the bony margins. And these imaging findings are compatible with cholesterol granuloma. Our next example of a pseudo lesion is demonstrated here on the sagittal T1 image of this 25 year old patient, where we notice relative heterogeneity of the marrow signal within the clivus. We also notice some heterogeneity of the marrow within the upper cervical spine and the calvarium. In contrast, this sagittal T1 image of the 70 year old patient, we see very homogeneous fatty marrow signal within the clivus calvarium and upper cervical spine. And this is simply an example of normal heterogeneous marrow due to a combination of red and yellow marrow in this young patient. In contrast, on this example, we see near complete replacement of the marrow signal within the clivus as demonstrated on both the sagittal and axial T1 weighted images. Additionally, on the ASL perfusion sequence, we see hyperperfusion of this lesion. And in this patient with known lung cancer, this was compatible with an osseous metastasis. So the key here is that in a younger patient without any known malignancy, heterogeneity of the marrow signal can be a normal finding. If there is ever any concern, a follow-up study can be recommended, such as a nuclear medicine bone scan or, and or recommendation to correlate with laboratory values, which may demonstrate anemia leading to more marrow reconversion. In this next example, 
of a pseudo lesion, we see significant asymmetry of the jugular foramina, much larger on the left than on the right. However, we note that there is preservation of the normal jugular spine, which is a small bony projection, which partially divides the jugular foramen into the pars venosa and pars nervosa. In contrast, in this example, where we also have marked asymmetric enlargement of the left jugular foramen, we notice that the jugular spine is no longer present. This patient went on to have MR imaging, and we see here a large dumbbell-shaped mass that is markedly expanding that jugular foramen. It demonstrates avid enhancement with some areas of central heterogeneity, and this was a uh, pathologically proven jugular foramen schwannoma. So the key here is that in cases of normal asymmetry of the jugular foramen, we should always look for the preservation of the normal jugular spine. In this next example, we see an apparent lesion within the right middle ear. However, on further inspection, we see that this is actually contiguous with the petrous carotid canal, as seen on both the axial and coronal CT images. And this is an example of an aberrant ICA. This entity is associated with underdevelopment or absence of the cervical ICA and an enlarged inferior tympanic artery, which courses through the middle ear and anastomosis with the petrous ICA, as demonstrated in our example. In contrast, in this case, we see a true lesion within the right middle ear, which is clearly distinct and discrete from the right carotid canal, as seen on both the axial and coronal images. And in this patient who was experiencing pulsatile tinnitus, this was compatible with a glomus tympanicum. We will now move on to the don't touch lesions. As opposed to the entities we have discussed thus far, these are true lesions and should be recognized based on imaging alone without any need or recommendation for a biopsy, which can in fact be very harmful and even fatal for the patient. However, some of the entities may require surgical intervention for treatment, as we will see. In this first, first example, we see a well-defined lucent lesion on the dorsal aspect of the clivus. In this second example of the same entity, we again see lucent lesion along the dorsal aspect of the clivus. However, this time it appears slightly more irregular and there is suggestion of an osseous stalk. And these are both examples of echordosis fissilifera. Staying on the same theme, on these sagittal T1 and axial and coronal T2 weighted images, we see a lesion, a well-defined lesion on the dorsal aspect of the clivus, which is T2 hyperintense and appears slightly lobulated on that coronal image. And finally, in this next example of the same entity, we see here a lesion that is actually extending from the dorsal aspect of the clivus into the prepontine cistern. And we see here on the axial that that prepontine component is T2 hyperintense and abuts but does not exert any mass effect on that basilar artery. And these two are examples of echordosis fissilifera. This is a benign intradural hamartomatous lesion which is derived from residual notochord. These rests of residual notochord can be found anywhere from the skull base to the sacrum, but are most often encountered here along the dorsal aspect of the clivus. This lesion is asymptomatic and, incident and often incidentally found on imaging and demonstrates no growth on subsequent imaging. The key here is that echordosis fissilifera is histologically indistinguishable from chordoma. Therefore, imaging is key, and our clinical colleagues really rely on us 
and on our interpretation to determine whether a lesion here requires any further uh, workup or not. If the lesion has the characteristic appearance of a echordosis fissilifera, no further follow-up is needed. However, if there is any concern, a follow-up CT or MRI could be obtained to ensure stability of the lesion. Again, on CT, we see the well-defined lucent lesion along the dorsal aspect of the clivus. We may see the osseous stalk, which connects the clival component with the intradural component. And on MRI, these lesions demonstrate high signal on T2, low signal on T1, and no associated enhancement. In contrast, in this example, we see at first what appears to be a similar lesion on that dorsal aspect of the clivus. However, as we scroll more laterally, we see that this is actually contiguous with a much larger soft tissue mass that extends along the dorsal aspect of the clivus as well as the dorsum cella. And on the post-contrast images, we see that this lesion demonstrates homogeneous enhancement. On the DWI and ADC map, we see that this lesion demonstrates restricted diffusion. So these imaging findings are all compatible with chordoma. And this was a pathologically proven case of chordoma. Moving on to our next don't touch lesion, here we see three examples of the same entity with slightly different appearances. In the first example on the top left, we see this benign expansion of the right frontal, I'm sorry, the left frontal supraorbital calvarium. And it demonstrates a homogeneous ground glass appearance on this CT. Our second example on the top right is much more heterogeneous in appearance with areas of both sclerosis and lucency. But again, we see a benign expansion of the bone. And in, in this third example on the bottom, we see a much more lucent appearance on the CT, which correlates with a cystic appearance on the MRI, again with this benign expansion of the bone. And these are all examples of fibrous dysplasia. Staying on the same theme, here in this case, we see again this expansion of the bone involving the left frontal supraorbital calvarium, it demonstrates T2 hypointensity, and on the post-contrast images, we see both peripheral and central enhancement of this lesion. In this patient with uh, extensive leptomeningeal carcinomatosis, as seen here on the axial post-contrast image, and a history of breast cancer, this was initially thought to be concerning for an osseous metastasis. Thankfully, the patient went on to have a CT, which demonstrated the classic, again, benign expansion of the bone and the ground glass appearance of this lesion, compatible with fibrous dysplasia and not an osseous metastasis. So fibrous dysplasia affects the skull and facial bones in up to a quarter of patients with monoostotic fibrous dysplasia, and in up to 50% of patients with polyostotic fibrous dysplasia. The key, again, is to recognize the benign expansion of the bone. And on CT, we can uh, encounter different patterns. The ground glass pattern is the most common, seen in over 50% of patients. However, we can also encounter a more dense sclerotic pattern and a more cystic pattern, as seen in our examples. On MRI, the key is to recognize the low T2 signal of these lesions due to their fibrous component. And as we saw in our example, these lesions do enhance after the administration of IV contrast. And this should not be considered a concerning feature. Further confounding the picture, <clears throat> these lesions can be FDG avid. So particularly in patients with known malignancy who are undergoing uh, a PET-CT, it's important to ensure that there is correlation with the CT imaging to ensure that the uh, lesion um, 
demonstrates this benign expansion of the bone and one of the classic uh, CT patterns. So correlation with the CT is key. Moving on to our next category of don't touch lesions, we see here a smooth expansile lesion within the ethmoid, within the right ethmoid cavity with some thinning and perhaps dehiscence of that right medial orbital wall. On the coronal image, we see here a wide de osseous defect within that right cribriform plate with clear extension of the intracranial contents into this lesion. This patient went on to have MRI, which demonstrates uh, T2 hyperintensity within this lesion compatible with CSF. And on the coronal image, we see extension of the right inferior herniation, I should say, of the right inferior frontal lobe through this defect into this uh, lesion. Uh, with some tethering at the point of herniation. And these findings are compatible with a meningoencephalocele of the frontoethmoidal region. Staying on the same theme, here we again see the smooth expansion of the right sphenoid sinus with marked sort of bowing um, and remodeling of that intrasphenoid septum. On the soft tissue windows, we see fluid attenuation within this lesion. This patient also went on to have an MRI where we again clearly see herniation of intracranial contents through this defect into this lesion with uh, both CSF, meninges, as well as brain tissue herniating uh, through this, again, compatible with a meningoencephalocele of the sphenoid sinus. In this uh, next example of, uh, again, a similar entity, we see here uh, a lucent, uh, well-defined sort of expansile lesion within that left petrous apex. There Again, there's some thinning or dehiscence of the uh, bony margins. This patient went on to have MRI, and we see here a clear communication between this lesion within the petrous apex and Meckel's cave. And this is a compatible with a meninga seal of the petrous apex. Finally, one more example of this entity. Here we see a small osseous defect in the region of the tegmin tympani with herniation of what appears to be intracranial contents through this defect. Patient went on to have an MRI, which again demonstrates herniation of that right inferior temporal lobe through that small defect. We also see a mastoid effusion in this patient who was having otorrhea and recurrent bouts of meningitis. And this is compatible with an encephalocele of the temporal bone. So these are all examples of CSF fistulas in various locations. These occur at sites of osteodural defects. They can be congenital or acquired, and when acquired, they can be traumatic, uh, non-traumatic, uh, related to either an underlying mass lesion or infection, or they can be spontaneous. On CT, we um, can see the osseous defect through which these fistulas occur, and we often see this smooth expansion and remodeling of the bone at the region of herniation. On MRI, uh, which is very helpful, we can see the contents of these um, fistulas, whether they only contain CSF and meninges or whether they also contain some brain tissue, as we saw in our first couple of examples. Um, the key here is that if um, these lesions aren't carefully evaluated on uh, both CT and MRI, they can be confused uh, with a mucosal polyp or other uh, sinonasal um, mass. Um, in some patients, uh, the smaller uh, fistulas may be asymptomatic or even incidental, uh, but in other patients, um, symptoms can include rhinorrhea, uh, otorrhea based on the location of the fistula, uh, bouts of meningitis, uh, and also cranial nerve deficits. Um, as was the case in this patient with the petrous apex meningocele who was having 
um, symptoms of uh, trigeminal neuralgia. Um, in this uh, last example of, our, of a don't touch lesion, we see abnormal contour and bulging along the lateral wall of the right sphenoid sinus. Um, on this um, uh, axial CT, CT image through a slightly different level, we see suggestion of peripheral calcification um, involving this lesion. The patient went on to have an MRI, uh, which demonstrates this very large and very T2 hypointense lesion um, along the region of the uh, right cavernous sinus and sphenoid uh, bone. And on the post-contrast images, we see that the anterior portion of this lesion uh, demonstrates avid enhancement, whereas the posterior component is non-enhancing. Um, due to a very high suspicion that this uh, represented a vascular lesion, um, a CTA was recommended, which was performed demonstrating a giant partially thrombosed right ICA aneurysm, uh, which is also nicely demonstrated on the 3D uh, MIP images. And uh, recognizing this, of course, is uh, absolutely key um, to uh, recommend the necessary vascular imaging as any kind of uh, biopsy of this lesion can uh, be fatal. So in summary, we have reviewed uh, some key pseudo lesions of the skull base. We have also reviewed some key don't touch lesions of the skull base. And again, we've tried to emphasize in all um, cases um, the uh, importance of avoiding unnecessary workup and potential harm to patients by uh, making the correct diagnosis of these uh, entities and these lesions uh, based on our imaging alone. I thank you for your attention, and I would just like to close by saying that although there is uh, still a lot of uncertainty about where we will be next year, I do certainly hope that we will be able to meet in person for next year's ASHNR in my beautiful hometown of San Diego. I hope to see you all then. Thank you. Our final speaker for this session is Dr. Kirsch who serves as the Division Chief of Neuroimaging at Northwell Health, North Shore University Hospital. And the title of her talk is Skull Base, Inflammation versus Malignancy, Distinguishing Imaging Features. Welcome to Skull Base, Inflammation versus Malignancy, Distinguishing Imaging Features. I'd first like to thank and acknowledge Dr. Alona Schmalfus, who's put together an outstanding program in head and neck radiology and invited me to come speak to today. I wish we could all be together like we've been in the past, but hopefully we will be again soon in the future. I need to disclose I'm a consultant for Primal Pictures, and I'll be using those images to highlight key anatomy in my talk, and I've had grant funding. But in this next half hour, my goals of this lecture are to look at the skull base and give you a map. And not just a map if we'd all gotten together in Florida and gone to the Magic Kingdom and maybe checked out the new restaurant, the Sam's Regal Eagle Smokehouse. Uh, this is a Sam, so if you do see Sam appear on a slide, that's telling you to pay attention and remember that might show up on a question later. But to take a look at that skull base and understand how it got those names and the terminology going along with what's happening in inflammation and in tumor involvement. So we think about the Greeks, they call that atlas and axis, those first two bones carrying that world, your brain on your shoulder. So we really want to focus on the mechanisms involved with tumor and how it spreads through the skull base and the involvement of the inflammatory response. We're going to talk about some key anatomic areas affected in the skull base. And of course, our goal is to really understand how this pathology creates the pictures we see to improve the diagnosis and treatment of patients with these disorders. So we think about the world itself, we're all affected currently by the COVID-19 virus, but in reality, the viruses are the most abundant microbes on the planet, and trillions of them fall on us from the sky each day. Importantly, the EBV virus is heavily related with skull-based tumors, especially nasopharyngeal carcinoma, which is the most common tumor in adults from the 40 to 60 year range. It's often non-keratinizing when related to EBV and has a better prognosis. Now, other things can cause cancer as well, as we know, tobacco or smoking or drinking. And all of those may be a keratinizing, which actually has a worse prognosis. We know that tumor 
just like inflammatory change can track along those key perineural routes, so we're going to show those. And of course, it's important to understand how it tracks along that into the skull base. And foreign bodies can also appear and mimic the appearance of tumor with a reactive appearance on a PET CT. We're going to talk about necrotizing otitis external, which can also look hot on PET. And we're going to talk about granulomatosis with polyangitis, formerly known as Wegner's. We'll talk briefly about neurosarcoid, as well as idiopathic inflammatory pseudotumor. It's now no longer considered the correct term. Mainly, we now call it IgG4-related disease or the inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor. And lastly, we'll talk about pyoderma gangrenosum, which can also mimic the appearance of tumor. So if we look at these two, they have different imaging characteristics, and sometimes we can't always tell them apart, but there are a few clues that may help us. So let's start with EBV. We know that this is a very infective virus. It involves the B cells, the T cells, and the epithelium. If you're young, as a child, you might get flu. As a teenager, infectious mononucleosis. And we know that certain subtypes and populations, especially Afro-American children, might have a Burkitt's lymphoma. If you've got immunocompromised patients, either from drugs with a transplant or other etiologies, they might end up with a post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder. Now, EBV is a virus that's been around since dinosaurs. It's a herpetic virus, it's a very large gamma virus, and it has a double-stranded circular DNA. There are two major subtypes seen either in Africa or around the rest of the world, and it's a very infective virus. It involves the B cells, the T cells, and the epithelium, and any sort of secretion allows it to be transmitted. It has an envelope, which has got these surface projection glycoproteins, and an outer tegmin, and then an inner tegmin, and then these major capsid proteins. Inside, you've got the lipid envelope surrounding the virus, and it's a double-stranded DNA genome with about 85 genes. Now, 95% of humans on the planet, all of us contain antibodies, which means we've been infected and we have the EBV hanging out inside our B cells. It's also the first virus associated with cancer, and that's due to this gentleman, Burkitt. After World War II, Burkitt decided he wanted to serve underserved nations, and he went to Rwanda. While he was there, and, and, and Uganda, and while he was there, he noticed that these kids had these massive tumors in their jaws, so he wrote for a grant, got a $25 grant, and he used it very wisely. He said, are there other clinics who see these kids with these tumors? And there were, and he treated these with cyclophosphamide and had a very good result. And he presented his work at a national meeting such as this. Of course, it was together, not virtually as we're doing now. At his lecture was actually a pathologist named Epstein who said, I'd love to look at your samples. And in doing so, that's how they discovered that this tumor was caused by the Epstein-Barr virus. Now we know it likes lymphoreticular tissue in the nasopharynx, and we know that there's lots of lymphoreticular tissue right along the roof of the nasopharynx. Of course, if we look at the anatomy of the nasopharynx, we see it sits right at the base of the skull base, and any sort of tumor that gets into this region can track easily on the adjacent nerves that are present. In this young patient who was at our institution, we have a three-year-old male, he was an African-American male, who had loosened teeth and he had difficulty chewing and he had right facial swelling. We can see that this tumor often has a higher density because of the nuclear cytoplasmic ratio and as we see here, can track perineural along the V2 nerves in the infraorbital foramina, into the pterygopalatine fossa and into the skull base. On MR, we see loss of the normal fatty T1 marrow. It's very dense, and it can track anywhere along the nerves that track in through this region into the skull base. Now, EBV is associated with lymphomas, but you may not be aware it's also associated with breast cancer now, Parkinson's and MSA, and multiple other tumors. And why is that? Because this virus is very clever. It enters via certain receptors with your own cells, and once it enters there, it deposits the genome, and that surrounding viral capsid dissolves. So it basically hangs out and sits as an episome inside your cells. Now it sits there and if it starts to activate, the T cells often control it inside the B cells. However, when it decides to replicate, it does so by using the majority of your own body's replication system, meaning about one-tenth of its own genome is used for replication. The remaining activates your body, and therefore the glycoproteins on that outer surface are often your own proteins, which your immune system sees. So again, it infects the epithelial cells. Often your T cells keep it in check, but if your T cells are destroyed, either from being um, on immunosuppressive drugs or some sort of other infection or age, 
then the, then the B cells can reactivate. And if they do so, we see that in patients who are on immunosuppressive medications with post-transplant disease, or in elderly patients who might have an aggressive reactivation of the virus in the B cells. And that allows it to start replicating. Be wary, it can have a very aggressive appearance. It can also mimic the appearance of a fungal sinusitis, as we see here. Now, it can track along the nerves, those key branches of five or seven, and it's important to understand those routes because that allows the tumor to track into the pterygopalatine fossa, as we see here, and you see the loss of the normal fat planes. We can see it tracks along any of the V3 routes that allow it to go up through frame and ovale, as pointed by this red arrow, and allow it to go into cranial, up into the cavernous sinus, and through the skull base. It can go along anywhere that there's the muscles of mastication, or it can also involve those tensor valli palatini, tensor tympani, as well as involving anywhere that there's these ganglion, including the otic, the pterygopalatine, or the submenibular gland, where branches of five and seven tend to run together. Now, the facial nerve, as we know, has a branchial motor, as well as a visceral motor, that vidian nerve, little sensory behind the ear, and the important special sensory, the chorda tympani, that the nerve of taste in the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. Also importantly, there are connections such as a small auricular temporal nerve. As written beautifully in this article by Dr. Schmalfus, we can see that this nerve actually splits, comes around the middle meningeal artery, and then joins into the main trunk of V3. Now, if we look at this nerve on an axial T1, as in this article, here's the normal appearance. And when it gets infiltrated by tumor, we can see it allows connections between the branches of seven in the parotid to the V3 trigeminal nerve. And here in a patient from our own tumor board who had a squamous cell of the parotid gland, we can see the tumor has now tracked along the branches of seven along that auricular temporal nerve right to the V3 branch and the main trunk. It also, as we see in this patient here, we have a 46-year-old who had a squamous cell of the mandible. We can see the muscles of mastication are involved. We can see tumor tracking through V3 through ovale, intracranially, and involving the dura of the floor of the middle cranial fossa. In the axial plane on this same patient, we can see how the tumor has tracked along the auricular temporal nerve, involving both the branches of seven, as well as going to the V3 um, route, allowing it to go into the skull base via, via frame and ovale. So if we look at the ears, of course, these can be affected. And normally our ear maintains that eustachian patency by yawning, we kind of equalize pressure. In some patients, however, you may have a patchless or enlarged eustachian tube. And this makes them miserable because they hear the voice in their head all the time. So this was treated in the past by filling it with Teflon. So we would take a burning syringe and inject Teflon to kind of seal this opening. The problem with Teflon, however, this inert polymer discovered in 1938, is the body doesn't really know how to react and it causes this marked inflammatory response. It's often then picked up by giant cells and phagocytized and you can form these really large form body giant cell reactions to it. And we had a patient come to our tumor board, this 55 year old, and she had a PET CT. And that PET CT picked this up and she was told she had a large skull based tumor and needed aggressive surgery. Except when we did the CT scan, we didn't see a massive tumor. We saw this high density material. And we can see on MRI, T1, and this post gap with fat set, that again, there's some material with enhancement, but this is not a tumor mass. In fact, 35 years prior, she'd had a patchless eustachian tube that had been treated with Teflon. And we know Teflon is used in multiple places in the body. It can be used to separate nerves and vessels for trigeminal neuralgia and cause the same reactivity. And it can also be used and mimic the appearance, obviously, of a CP angle tumor, but history is obviously critical. And we notice it does not go into the IAC per se here, as well as being treated for such things as vocal cords, where it can cause also high uptake on a PET CT, or can be used for velopharyngeal insufficiency in the throat and also demonstrate increased uptake on PET. Therefore, history is critical prior to doing a PET CT if there's been any placement of foreign body material, which can cause this marked active uptake and you don't wanna have a false positive result or call these tumors. Now, if we look at other things that can inflame the skull base, we can take a look at the ear. And in diabetic populations, you might see this large reactive infective process called necrotizing otitis externa. Now, this can be caused by pseudomonas, um, but other organisms may cause it as well. Often we see this in elderly and diabetic patients and they have severe otalgia. The mortality, even despite antibiotics, is up to about a third of patients. So it's caused by this organism, the pseudomonas, and it's a very adaptable organism. If your host defenses are down, either from neutropenia or burns, it can then infect you. And it's the most second common infection seen in ventilators. We know that it attaches via these pillow and flagelli. 
Once it does so, it has this little secre secretion system which allows it to inject things into your cells. So it will inject these lipases and it targets your own host surface membranes. And once it does so, it breaks apart your tight junctions and your cells separate from each other and fall apart. It also injects pyocyanin or pyoverdin, which competes with your own body for iron and electron transport and allows it to get a competitive edge and multiply. Necrotizing otitis externa usually starts along that external object canal. Here in this patient, we can see this thickening and soft tissue thickening of the EAC, and it spreads through that osteocartilaginous junction through the fissures of Santorini. Now, it's not this Santorini, which we all wish we could go visit, but we can't right now. Rather, it's that opening along the cartilaginous um, external object canal, which is basically got collagen filling this gap in here, and that's Collagen has these fissures that allows infection or tumor to transmit itself from the ear to the parotid and vice versa, so a really important space. So if we look at these patients, we often see the external otitis canal is swollen, as we see here. We see bony erosive changes as it causes an osteomyelitis along these margins, and we importantly look for loss of the retrocondylar fat pad, a very important finding indicating this is likely an infective process. Now, if we look at that, we see on T1 and MR that there'll be decreased T1 marrow signal. We can see in T2, it's very bright signal with fluid tracking out throughout this region. We notice that we'll diffusely enhance, and the tissues are enlarged here and inflamed, but they're not destroyed like we see in tumor. And here we can actually see the pus-filled eustachian tube and can in some patients form a deep space cellulitis or abscess. But notice it tends to track out laterally as the infection goes in, and that loss of the retrocondylar fat pad is a very helpful finding. It can be hot, however, on PET, and that can be misleading because it can look like a tumor, so be careful to look for the retrocondylar fat pad and pay attention to the overlying soft tissues. So if we notice in this patient with necrotizing otitis externa, it's kind of tracked along the eustachian tube. The tissues are inflamed and enlarged, but they're still preserved, versus this patient with a nasopharyngeal carcinoma, where we see the mass filling that fossa of Rosenmuller and then tracking along perineural with widening of foramen ovale going into the skull base. Now, the petrus apocytis, and notice Sam is here telling us to pay attention, was described when Gradenigo, an Italian otologist, noticed that you've got this triad of involvement of the otitis, which is very infective, and it involves an ipsilateral involvement of cranial nerve 6. So they often have a abducens palsy, and they also involve cranial nerve 5. So remember, 5 and 6, and they get a trigeminal neuralgia with pain along the distribution of the fifth nerve, and that is termed Gradenigo syndrome. Now, if we take a look at this space, we know that Dorello, when he first heard about this, wasn't quite convinced. So he did his own dissections, and he looked to see that, yes, there's this space, which has this little Gruber's ligament, the petrous renatal ligament above, and down below is the clivus and the petrous apex. And he said, yes, I think it contains cranial nerve 6 and the inferior petrosal sinus. And that's where cranial 6 is involved by these inflama inflammatory processes. So if we look at cranial nerve 6, we see it exits and then it pierces the dura of the dorsum cell of the sphenoid, and then it's got to jump over that petrous apex to get into the cavernous sinus. So when they look at the curves of cranial nerve 6, researchers notice that it goes up, curves over, then it's got to curve into the medial portion of the cavernous sinus before going into the um, superior orbital fissure. And that second curve is really the key space. So by Dorello's definition, he called it this triangular space bordered by the ligament above and the clivus and the petrous down below, it's that second bend, and he said cranial nerve 6 always goes below that little uh, Gruber's ligament, and it has the opening of the inferior petrosal sinus. Except if we look at that definition, there's a lot of problems. Number one, it doesn't have complete bony margins, so it can't be a true canal. Number two, if you look at this a lot, you'll sometimes notice 6 goes above or below that Gruber's ligament. And lastly, when the operating and they go with microscopes, they've noticed that opening of the inferior petrosal sinus is actually outside of this region. So we do refer to this as Dorello's canal, but really it should be called the petroclival venous confluence. But why is that important? Well, because because cranial nerve 6 is tethered at those two dural points, it is very sensitive to any sort of infection, inflammation, or increased intracranial pressure. Because it's fixed as it goes in, that uh, portion where it goes into the sphenoid, as well as going into the cavernous sinus. So it basically is a bellwether if there's things going on with intracranial pressure or inflammation along the skull base or in the brain, and is a very useful finding for helping us tell what's going on. So now that we've looked at six, let's look a little more anteriorly at the sinonasal region.
So in this patient, we can see that they've got a dehiscence of the nasal septum, and this is a 55-year-old with granulomatosis with polyangitis, formerly known as Wegner's, and we can see this prominent saddle nose deformity. And here on the CT, also demonstrating the bony destruction. So what's going on with this? Well, this is due to the antineutrophil cytoplasmic antibodies, or ANCAs, causing a vasculitis. And what is happening is that these specifically attack blood vessels. So we're going to talk about why this happens. So the ANCA systemic vasculitis really goes for the small and medium blood sized vessels, and these are found in the serum, and it causes a secondary autoimmune attack. Now this causes activation of the myeloperoxidases, proteinases, and these things targeted by the ANCAs then get attacked with neutrophils. Now often we see involvement of a necrotizing vasculitis, meaning it attacks the blood vessels, they get inflammatory response, and then it necrotizes and they form these necrotizing granulomatous lesions, as well as causing inflammation of the blood vessels along the kidneys. Now these patients have positive PR3 ANCAs, meaning these proteinases are activated, and there's genomes that are associated with these. So they have specific histocompatibility complexes that cause this. Now we know what goes on. You've got a, an antigen that presents to the T cells. Those T cells then differentiate to react to that antigen, and then it stimulates these macrophages. Now this primes up the neutrophils to create complement, and then these neutrophils, which are stimulated by bacteria, form these what are called neutrophil extracellular traps, or nets. So I made these little nets so you can recognize them. So the antigens of these kind of ramp up the production. These neutrophils are really primed, and they express those MPO and PR3 kind of enzymes that destroy things, and they bind with those nets. And when they bind onto certain things with those antibodies, it activates those myeloperoxidase and proteinases to destroy things. And unfortunately, with patients who have granulopatosis with polyangitis, these nets do not get degraded. They persist. And because they persist, there's more activation of the antigens and the destruction of these, en of these enzymes, which lead to destruction of the vessels. So these ANCAs are present, binding, the nets persist, and it leads to disruption of all the blood vessels, which get destroyed. Now, if we look specifically at the nasal cavity, then it makes sense for what we're seeing because you've got branches supplying from the internal and external carotid arteries. And the sphenopalatine artery is really the major branch. But notice these are terminal vessels. The blood supply is from lateral to medial, and there's not a lot of collateral supply coming in here. So if you destroy the blood vessels here and there's no collaterals, that tissue will necrose and go away. And that's important because you don't have enough collaterals to keep this tissue surviving. So what we see in often that dehiscent uh, portion of the nasal septum, but it can involve blood vessels as well, going to the ears with the serous otitis media. It can result in hearing loss or even a chronic otitis. And often middle ear involvement has a conductive hearing loss. We can see that it has some characteristic findings where there might be obliteration with constant mucosal thickening and neoosteogenesis. It can also kind of invade periantral soft tissues and leads to bony destruction, especially that septum in the midline because of the blood vessels that are involved. Often this is a classic appearance of midline bony destruction. It can also involve the orbit, one of the fourth common areas to be affected, with either involving the lacrimal tissue and also lead to visual loss. And you can see these ocular lesions typically demonstrate hypointensity on T2 as well as enhancement. Now the ANCA can also infect dura of the central nervous system. It can either be contiguous or can be secondary to a vasculitis. And you can have strokes as well in up to 4% of patients. And those of you with sharp eyes also noted the parotid involvement that can occur as well. Now if we look at ANCA here in this patient, this 43-year-old, we can see there's nasal septal disruption. We see there's lacrimal involvement. We also see the sinuses are involved as well as the lacrimal glands. Compare this to the patient with a NK lymphoma. Yes, there's also nasal septal disruption, but we can see this large lymphomatous mass. We can also see in these axial images of another patient with NK lymphoma, that lymphomatous tissue tends to infiltrate, as we see here, filling the fat planes of the orbit with loss of those normal tissue planes. In some cases, they can look very similar, and a biopsy has to be performed. So we're going to now look at neurosarcoid, and the name comes from a Norwegian dermatologist who, when he looked at these under the microscope, said, wow, these look like epithelial sarcoma cells. So that's how it got its name. But in fact, we know it has an inflammatory response and can have a variable appearance throughout the skull base and mimic just about anything. If we look at the pathological hallmark, it is these non-necrotizing granulomas. 
So we know that lymphocytes, especially CD4, get affected, and we know they cause these pro-inflammatory cytokines, and it causes an exaggerated constant T-cell response. What's interesting is if you lose your T-cells, either from HIV infection or some other um, thing that causes CD4 lymphopenia, the sarcoid will go into remission. If patients are treated and their T-cells come back with antiretroviral therapy, the sarcoid recurs. So we know it's related to that T-cell metabolism. It's unknown what really causes this right now, but it can be characterized as a granuloma formation, possibly by some sort of trigger. It, there may be genetic predisposition. We know certain subpopulations um, have HLL alleles and genetics related to this. And in black Americans, we see this 35.5 out of 100,000 versus white Americans, where it's only 10.9 out of 100,000. In certain subpopulations, especially with um, body mass index, if it's increased, that also increases the risk of having this disease. Now, we know it's associated with certain um, HLL antigens, but we don't know the full etiology of it yet, but we do treat it with anti-inflammatory medications such as corticosteroids. So now I wanna share a case that I had many years ago when I first started out as a 21-year-old male who had trismus and dysphagia. He had a left-sided neck mass and headache. And initially he was treated with antibiotics and no imaging, but he came back, however, because he had persistent trismus. In our first set of imaging, we saw this hyperdense mass on the CT invading the left carotid space, and we did an MRI which demonstrated extension and enhancement through foramen ovale and into the left middle cranial fossa and cavernous sinus. We then looked on T2 and noted it was very dark, kind of replacing that left paraphrangeal fat. We did a biopsy and we saw this fibrous proliferative process with lymphoplastic cells and we put him on steroids and he responded quite well. He was doing fine until several months later, he came back with decreased hearing and tinnitus in his left ear, repeat CT showed dense enhancement along the tentorium and we treated with steroids again. Over the next five months, however, he then developed a right gaze palsy. We then repeated imaging at this time and now he's developed increased enhancement, which is extending along the right middle cranial fossa, tracking toward the right masticator space, and the right lateral rectus muscle. And new edema then developed into the temporal lobe. We treated with steroids again. So this was back in 2001. We published this as this tumefactive fibroinflammatory lesion, not quite certain what was going on. So we now know that some people term this the inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor, which has various names in the literature. This can be characterized by this inflammatory infiltrate, as we saw in our patient. It has overlaps with IgG4-related disease, and there may be subsets of these patients that are associated with the Epstein-Barr virus. So what's going on when we see this? Well, it's often a tumor with inflammatory features related now, we know, to the chromosome 2, specifically with the anaplastic lymphoma kinase gene. And this leads to constitutive activation, especially if there's a proto-oncogene form with other genes leading to this tumor. These are now treated often with ALK inhibitors or COX-2 inhibitors as adjuvant therapy, and in some cases, steroids. And many people consider this an inflammatory kind of tumor with both tumor and inflammatory features, and there may be overlap that might be secondary to underlying genetics. We know that the inflammatory diseases have been described going back to 1892, when Milkoats described it in salivary tissue. And we also know that Telosid notices in patients describing left orbital pain. Hunt noticed the same in autopsies many years later, and they saw this inflammatory tissue extending along the skull base. Often this was a diagnosis of exclusion, and patients were treated with steroids with um, fairly good responses. So now, since 2003, however, we've established the IgG4. Now, IgG4-related diseases were first kind of described as discrete entities in 2003. And really the key hallmark is histopathology. You've got plasma cells, lymphocytes, and you've got the storiform kind of reed mat fibrosis pattern. It's an idiopathic process. The orbit is most commonly involved, and you need to exclude, of course, underlying infection or tumor involving this process. So if we remember from all of our immunoglobulins way back in medical school, you've got four different types of IgG, and IgG4 is the one that we're focusing on. And this is a very funny antibody. First off, it can split in half. It's really non-inflammatory. It doesn't bind complement, and it doesn't cause inflammation. So is it more of an antigen sink, and is the fibrosis driven by T cells? Nobody really knows. 
We know it's composed of heavy chains and light chains, like all the other antibodies, and it has a very funny ability to split in half and then exchange with each other so they can bind different antigens. But again, it does not activate the complement system, and it's more likely anti-inflammatory than pro-inflammatory. So what's going on here? Well, we have a B cell that gets presented with an antigen, and it can then differentiate, and it presents that antigen to the T cells. Once the T cells are activated, they start producing all the interleukin, the tumor growth factor, interferon, and that leads to the storiform fibrotic pattern. Now, at the site of the disease, those um, B cells activate those T cell receptors, and it leads to the storiform fibrosis, which has kind of a cartwheel pattern. So my daughter doing a cartwheel here to help you remember with this classic appearance. Now, at the same time, those T cells then represent that uh, antigen back to the B cells, and then the B cells start producing IgG4, and that's what we see related in this entity. Now, although it's recognized as a new clinical entity, there are no uniform international criteria. That's important because we don't really know exactly what the standard is yet, but it does respond to steroids and immunosuppressive therapy. Therefore, you exclude everything else, you look at it on biopsy, and often these patients do respond well with steroids. And other monoclonal anti rituximab has also been utilized. We know that there are four major subtypes now. I'm going to focus on the fact, easy to remember, that it's idiopathic, it's inflammatory, and very infiltrative. It goes everywhere, including along paths of perineural spread, and has some characteristic findings on CT MRI. So I'll give you four kind of pearls to take home with that. So remember it was first described in salivary tissue as Milcote's disease, which is lacrimal gland enlargement. And you can have this triad of dacrodinitis, enlarged parotid, and submenorrheal tissue. And that's a very predictive value for IgG4-related disease. We can see it's often composed of this fibrous tissue, inflammatory cells, and plasma cells. It can cause some increased or decreased density on CT. And it most commonly likes the orbit and the lateral rectus muscles. It can track along those routes. So remember, Sam just appeared here, some key four findings. On MR, it can be iso-intense. It has definitely enhances, and it's very dark on T2. And it can expand and cause bony growth of changes as it goes through the skull base. So those key radiographic pearls, dense material, kind of slightly increased in attenuation, sometimes is hyper or hypodense. It can most commonly affect the orbits with those lateral rectus muscles. And on MRI, it's T1 ISO, T2 dark, enhances avidly, and it goes everywhere. So Sam is telling you to pay attention to those key points, and that's a key pearls to take home from that. And lastly, I'd like to share a unique case of melanoma. So this was a gentleman who presented with melanoma. He also had known basal cell biopsy proven colitis. He had the scalp lesion that was removed and it was concerning for recurrent tumor. His wife was an attorney, sent us this picture. There was no fever or white count in this spot at all. On CT, it came up to the bones and looked like it invaded it, but there was no bony involvement and it looked like it enhanced with this ulcerative compartment. On MR, it was ISO and T1, and it had some enhancement along the margins, and he had ADC restricted, but there was no infection and some susceptibility, but there was no tumor in the sample. On PET, it was markedly avid, but notice the parotids are negative here. Remember scalp melanoma, very few people look at the top here, but often your hairdresser may be the one to pick this up. And in elderly patients, it can affect that scalp. And remember, it has those layers of skin, connective tissue, aponeurosis, loose areolar tissue, the pericranium. And in melanoma in elderly and all patients, it's often amelanotic with rapidly growing high-risk features. So it often tracks to lymph nodes, such as the parotids, and we can see that it can track into this area. So in this patient, we put a needle to figure out what's going on, and it was not melanoma, it was pyoderma gangrenosum. So there's an often abundance of dermal neutrophils, and in our case, like in this patient, associated with inflammatory bowel disease. This was first described in 1916. The, the term was coined in 1930, and it's an ulcerative inflammatory skin lesion. Our dog had this, so I'm pretty familiar with this as well. So just like in the, our patient, our dog responded well to steroid treatment, and it can be kind of treated, but you don't want to touch it too often. So in these cases, it occurs because of uh, pyrin, which normally blocks the inflammasome activation, gets affected when this protein, uh, PSTP1P1, doesn't is mutated. And if it's mutated, it blocks pyrin, which can no longer block the inflammasome, which gets activated, which leads to neutrophil activation into the skin.
So again, you've got impaired neutrophils because you've got a damaged protein which is blocking pyrin. It can cause these reactive changes in the skin and the more you biopsy, the worse you make it with a pathogen response. So pyoderma gangrenosum is an inflammatory, not infectious disease. It's associated with inflammatory bowel disease, as in our patient, and you treat it with uh, steroids. Our patient did well, as did our dog, after being treated appropriately and topically. Remember, you don't want to keep biopsying it because it can cause a pathogen phenomena. So we talked about foreign body inflammation, which can lead to this reactive response on PET. So be wary if patients have had any material placed in the body. Inflammatory changes may also occur from infections, such as a necrotizing otitis externa with a petrous apicitis. And remember, it often causes loss of that retrochondral fat pad, a key finding. We talked about granulomatosis with polyangitis, formerly known as Wegner's, and neurosarcoid. And we no longer really use that term idiopathic inflammatory pseudotumor. Many of these are now IgG4-related disease or might be inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor. We also mentioned pyoderma gangrenosum, just to be aware of, because it can really mimic tumor. We talked about the importance of EBV, which is a hepatic virus, which many of us are infected with, and it hangs out until it can replicate in our B cells, and the appearance can mimic many things, but it also tracks along the skull base and can track into via those neural routes that we talked about. We remember that on necrotizing otitis externa, that loss of the retrochondral fat pad is critical, whereas tumoral masses tend to be more central and track along those perineural routes. I thank you for your attention and hope to see all of you again someday in the future.